All right. Um, I wanted to begin also with a plug for our journal. Uh, this is uh, Quantum Studies, uh, uh, Mathematics and Foundations. Uh, so we are a journal dedicated to Quantum Foundations. Yakir and I run this journal together. Uh, and Quantum Foundations, our contributions are welcome. Even many world or contributions are welcome. And I would say this is a rival journal to Lev, but Lev lives actually in many worlds, so he's actually an editor on this journal as well. Uh, and so if, if you send me your paper, I will most likely immediately delegate it to Lev, and so he, will, he is in all worlds of your many worlder uh, uh, contributions. Okay. You're certainly, you're, we're very welcome to submit to our journal. Um, and I also wanted to give a plug for my book. So uh, the past two years, I've been working very hard to write a book about quantum measurement, uh, theory and practice. So I'm very pleased to say that Cambridge University Press will be publishing this book. I wrote it with my friend and colleague Irfan Siddiqui at UC Berkeley. Here we are parting, working hard before we finish the book, parting afterwards in Laguna Beach. Um, and so uh, I'm really happy about this book. I think it will be a really important contribution to help people understand about many of the new phenomena of quantum physics. So I, in this conference, I've heard a lot of understandings of some of the older discussions. But there has been the past decade or two, there's been a lot of new stuff discovered I think most people don't know about. I just want to give an outline. Here's sort of the table of contents for my book over here. And so you see on the left side there are the fundamental principles. So the chapter, say, well, so chapter one is basically an overview, historical overview of the field, and a summary of what we think of the important experiments that have been. The left side are fundamental principles. So chapter two are things like the, the things you might learn about in your, in your first textbook uh, in quantum mechanics. But then we go into generalized measurements. And I'm happy to say weak measurements and weak values are also under fundamental principles you hear. OK, very good. But then there are advanced topics, so topics about continuous quantum measurements, how to understand diffusive quantum measurements, stochastic master equations, stochastic path integral, going into quantum jumps, Geno effect, jump operators, and then employing feedback control, uh, various other topics like quantum error corrections. And then very importantly, the right-hand column is applications and implementations. So how do we actually do state-of-the-art quantum measurements, say with uh, atoms, with optics, photons, superconductors, uh, all of the formalism and technology that supports this uh, enterprise, and then how to do things like build an amplifier. Those are important concepts. Uh, and then finally, various phenomena of measurements, things like um, quantum measurement reversal. And so just as a kind of teaser, I'm going to give you a little quiz. So here are some questions I can ask you. How long does a measurement take? Can a measurement be reversed? Is it possible to track the quantum wave function collapse in time? And you can read the rest, but the point I want to make is I think there are probably only a, a very small percentage of physicists in the world that can answer those questions. And if you're a philosopher and you want to jump onto the leading uh, newest stuff to be able to philosophize about. Most of this stuff is interpretation free. This is just stuff that happens in the real world. Uh, and we motivate all of these things with experiments that have been carried out. And so everything is empirically verified. Um, and so this is, gives you, especially for the philosophers in the audience, a grist for your mill to borrow one of your catchphrases. Okay. So that's uh, my advertisement. Now I want to go into the, 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 the sort of the main subject of my talk. And this was uh, a subject when Lev asked me to speak in this meeting. Uh, I wanted to try to speak about something that was relevant for foundations, but also relevant for philosophers. And so uh, I'm talking about this paper uh, by uh, Frankinger and Rinner. Uh, the question, uh, the title is, Quantum Theory Cannot Consistently Describe the Use of Itself, uh, Nature Communications 2018. Um, and so this is a very interesting paper. Ultimately, we don't agree with it, but there are lots of papers I don't agree with. Nevertheless, I ignore them. This was the paper I did not ignore. I thought it was very interesting. And so even though we have a different uh, approach and a different conclusion, I think it's exciting. So I'm not giving this talk to beat up on uh, Renato Renner, who, who actually said he would be watching on YouTube. So I hope, I hope we can discuss about this afterwards. Here are the people that contributed to this. This is my, my research group together with Adam Frank. All right. 
I left. Can I get a glass of water? Would that be possible? Thank you. Okay, so what is the idea of this paper? <coughs> so the idea is that when you try to employ quantum uh, theory, especially in the vigorous friend type setup, you find yourself in a certain situation predicting on one hand something happens, but the, uh, another outcome also happens uh, with certainty. Okay? And so this is essentially the, 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 uh, the argument behind this paper that quantum theory essentially is self-inconsistent when applied uh, to certain Wigner friends type scenarios. And the spoiler is that we disagree, and so our paper is published about a year ago, and we argue there's a logical fallacy uh, in this argument. So here is the basic argument. Uh, you have a Wigner friend type setup where you have an experiment going on in one laboratory, and then uh, there is, there is a, uh, another, another friend outside of the laboratory that's that, that is describing also the results of the friend and the laboratory. Thank you very much. And then there are a number of postulates uh, given. I'm not going to go into them all because they're a little bit uh, involved, but if you take these different assumptions together, U, S, Q, C, all of this together leads to some kind of contradiction. So certain outcomes are possible to occur in reality in the quantum formalism, despite being ruled out by applying these uh, assumptions, and therefore there's an internal inconsistency. So this is their argument in a nutshell. Uh, so what I wanted to do is, is argue, sort of unpack this argument, and, and because when you read the paper, it's quite opaque in my opinion, so I wanted to try to understand it with my group. And uh, here is essentially the way we understand what's going on. So we argue that the three apparently incompatible properties uh, used to question the consistency of quantum mechanics correspond to two logically distinct contexts. Either it's one type of experiment or it's the other. And our claim is that the basic argument of Froschinger and Renner combine these two contexts into one context. Let me elaborate on what I'm talking about. So either one, so what are these two contexts? Either one assumes that Bigner has full control over his friend's lab, or conversely, some parts of the lab remain unaffected by Wigner's subsequent measurements. Okay? And the first context, we actually argue, can be seen as a kind of quantum erasure of the memory of the Wigner's friend. And we sh sh further show these properties are, okay, I'll get into this part later. I don't want to spoil my, 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 uh, my punchline here. All right, so let me, let me try to uh, flesh this out a little bit in some detail. And so I always find when I'm trying to deal with this kind of thought experiment, it's nice to make a real experiment that it would actually correspond to. Now, I know that, that our Munich friends are here, and they're working hard on Lev's uh, experiment involving my, my famous dove prism now. Uh, and so whenever you get tired of the famous dove prism, I give you something else to work on. And so let me explain. Uh, so what, what did we do? So the, here's an important, so, so from the, for the philosophers in the audience, here's something I think does a lot of work for us in a philosophical context. So what we do is, is uh, we're, I'm in, in a little bit I'm going to talk about an optical interferometer. And immediately you're going to say, Andrew, Andrew, what are you talking about? I thought we were talking about observers, macroscopic observers, and how they describe, blah, 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 blah. The important philosophical concept is we're going to introduce the concept of a memory. All right? So we derive a necessary condition for the quantum system to behave as an observer from the point of view of any other observer, the existence of a stable degree of freedom that we refer to as the memory. So this concept is really key for us in our argument, which becomes entangled with the measurement system and retains a record of the measurement outcome until the end of the experiment. Okay? So for this the thing to act as a memory, we don't touch it until the end of the experiment, uh, yeah, untouched for the duration of the considered experiment. Okay, so, so this is this concept of memory we use. All right, so how are we going to erase this memory? And what, is it, what are we talking about here? So we begin with just a simple Mach Zinter interferometer. So we have an input single photon state. It can split in two ways, two beam splitters. It goes hot here, here. If, it, if the interferometer is balanced appropriately, every photon in goes out uh, and never, only to this detector, never to that detector. Now we're going to make it more complicated. We introduce the polarization of the photon. So now we introduce polarizing beam splitters. So horizontal is transmitted, vertical is reflected. 
and we put them in front of these detectors. And now we have four detectors. So there's path one, path two, uh, detectors, polarizing beam splitters, HVVH. So that's the next level of complexity. There's one more level of, okay, okay so now what we're going to do is we can also put a which path marker. If we want to understand which way the, path, the, the photon is going, we can put in a, uh, a, a, um, a wave plate in one of the arms of the interferometer, which rotates H to V, for example, which marks the path. And so here the photon, the polarization for us, acts as a quantum memory for which path the photon takes. So if I can detect, so if, if H uh, is going, so, so this is a regular beam splitter, remember, and so I put in H, and I know that H goes along this path, but then V is going to go from here on to that path. But we, can, we can then track the two different uh, arms. So we can also then, once we uh, mark it, we can also erase it by putting in another of these uh, wave plates that brings H back to V, which acts as a kind of eraser of this uh, memory that we've encoded. All right. So consequently, we say the measurement of the which path degree of freedom in such an experiment is possible only if the memory is preserved. Okay. So now we can talk a little bit about Wigner's friend. So the idea now is we have uh, Wigner, uh, say, outside, looking in a laboratory with his friend in it, doing some experiments on a quantum system. I'm going back to his 1961 paper, Remarks on the Mind-Body Problem in Quantum Mechanics. And uh, we, we can and then have Wigner put questions to this idealized uh, friend in the laboratory with the, with the understanding that we're eventually going to try to put this person in superposition if such a thing makes any sense. All right, so, um, so yes, yeah, so this is one possibility where they can talk to each other. Another possibility is there's no communication, and Wigner checks out the spin for himself to be able to check consistency for what's going on, and then Wigner can also then assign a density matrix before the spin um, beforehand. Okay, so here is the uh, Franago Rinner claim. There exist scenarios in which Wigner and Wigner's friend claims taken together contradict experimental fact. So that's the sort of the summary of their, of their article in 2018, where the friend infers one thing, but Wigner infers the other, so you're having a contradiction. So what we did is we converted all of these concepts. Uh, so, Vic, so this original article is kind of a Byzantine nest of a quantum coin being passed back and forth between Wigner and the friend. It, so we wanted to unpack that. So we mapped all of these concepts uh, between uh, the article from the, the original notations uh, in the Franega Renier article in terms of some okay fail coin flip stuff into some optical degrees of freedom of a single photon. And the role of the two friends' memories uh, are basically are they to measure, they are played by different degrees of freedom of a single traveling, single photon traveling through interferometer. Right. And so for our purposes, these three degrees of freedom can be modeled by three different qubits. So here is the interferometer. So again, to, to, to our Munich friends, uh, here's something you can play with if you want to. Um, so the idea is that we're going to draw two different boxes. And so one is the friends measurement setup in the red box. The other is the Wigner setup in the blue box. And what we claim is that there are two different contexts in this article. And I can illustrate the two different contexts is by drawing context A or context B. And the idea is that the, there's a difference in the, in the second box. This little element here, this red bar indicating I map uh, 1 back to 2. By the way, what is 1 and 2? I didn't tell you. That's an additional degree of freedom. You can think about that as the mode of the photon. So like if I'm in a, the first mode or the second mode, that they're orthogonal to another. So we need this other, another mode degree of freedom to be able to uh, uh, realize this experiment. Okay. And so, uh, you, so we argue the claims, the argument of this Franeger Rinegar involved conflating the two experiments. It's like imagining you doing both experiments at the same time, when in fact you either do this experiment or you do that experiment. So this is, the, this is our counterclaim. So how does it work? Um, so the idea is that uh, to predict outcomes with setup one, we should not be using the properties of setup two. And we argue that this contradiction arises from combining the properties of the two different experimental contexts. 
And the context of these, of these uh, experiments, the idea is now we have a, uh, not a ha one half, one half polarizer, or a, a po beam splitter rather, but a uh, 3366 beam splitter here. We have this two to one mode shape uh, converter, a diagonal polarization to, 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 to vertical polarization, and then either we go back one to two, and then we have some other either regular beam splitters or polarizing beam splitters. And essentially, the, the uh, argument uh, of Franeger and Renner is that this particular detector should fire 1 12th of the time in this particular setup, but the, uh, the, we argue the fallacious reasoning of the, uh, of the Renner, Renner paper argues that it never fires. Okay. And so this is the context with this uh, quantum eraser where no experiment can be made. Uh, but this is the context where we have this which path marker that it enables the measurement of the, of the paper. And so this marker is acting as the role of the memory in this experiment, which all observers would, in principle, uh, agree on. Okay, um, so what, what is, what is the reasoning that this works? Basically, we argue from two, so, so this is our understanding of this article, uh, from two, uh, context two, context one, the photon takes a particular path, say left or right. If left, the polarization is diagonal. If right, the polarization is vertical. But from one, if OK, uh, OK here is that the, one of these top two guys fail, uh, fire, the polarization was not V, so there's Mox inner interference, and then we combine, suppose OK is achieved. Then the polarization was not V, the particular path was taken, so the path was I, therefore the polarization is D. Since the polarization is D, the polarization is not A. And the conclusion from this is that A-OK -okay is impossible. So this detector never fires using this set of reasoning. And so again, we have to somehow combine the reasoning from these two different contexts into one context to make that argument work. So our conclusion is uh, that we reject this. All right. So you might say, okay, Andrew, this is fine and good. You've devised this little uh, interferometer, interferometer, but how do you know somebody more clever than you couldn't come along and devise a better interferometer or a better quantum system that would verify the claims of this article? And so we have a very general that this is, in fact, impossible. Here is our argument. What we impact this, ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to measure three different observables in the setup involving three qubits. The observable looks something like this. The first, the first uh, column is the polarization. The second column is the, uh, is the um, uh, which path degree of freedom. And the third path is the which shape degree of freedom. And in order to make this argument work, you have to be able to measure all three of these observables, O1, O2, O3. And you see that these are all projection operators with eigenvalues either 0 or 1. But our main observation is that these do not commute. So if I can help compute the commutator of these different uh, objects, one computes, commutes with two, one commutes with three, but two commute does not commute with three. And therefore, the conclusion is that no possible experiment can measure these observables jointly without disturbance of one of the properties. So that's our general proof that such an experiment is impossible to build. All right, so I'm just wrapping up now. So the conclusion. Uh, again, at this very interesting article that I was very stimulated by, uh, Farnegar and Renner, uh, so it involves, in, in our view anyway, combining properties of two distinct experimental contexts, one of which happens to correspond to erasure of Wigner's friend, uh, the memory of Wigner's friend, and as my colleague Kai Wagel likes to say, friends don't let friends erase other friends' memories. Uh, by erasing his friend's memory, Wigner uh, negates the usefulness of his friend's observation for predicting the future, and our claim is that this contradiction involves combining claims about non-commuting observables. So thanks very much for your attention. You say that if two things don't commute, you can't measure them together, but it's possible that if you have a particular state, uh, for that particular state, the commutator can be equal to zero, even though two things don't commute. So you have to show, to show more that they don't commute, that doesn't exist a particular eigenstate for which they 
Yeah, as usual, here is exactly right. Uh, you can take the commutator and then take its expectation value in a particular state and show it's zero in that particular state. So you need to go beyond that and saying for the states that we, we use, the input, you know, input of the state, that it is not, um, not commuting on that, uh, uh, on that uh, subspace. So exactly right, you care. Maybe, maybe I should say that I'm still a Veritian, but I found out better what are the contributions of all the people that contributed to this, and uh, I also sharpened my understanding of this. So, in particular, I must say I had the pleasure to discuss with Don Page, which uh, sort of wrote a paper which I... I uh, I thought was describing exactly my understanding of the world, and then I figured out it's not. <laughs> so, okay. Regarding uh, your experiment, I, I missed what the second uh, one to two uh, degree of freedom uh, is used for, and and what exactly it is. You, you said it's two different modes, but it's. Yeah, so, so in the Frodinger Rinegar argument, essentially you need th three qubits to make this work. And so, so we have one qubit, which is like the which path degree of freedom. Does the photon go this way or that way in the interferometer? The other degree of freedom is polarization. Is the polarization H, V, diagonal, anti-diagonal? And the third one is, you can think about it, is just the mode. So you have a transverse mode. If you have like a hermit gauss mode of the transverse mode, it's either like this or it's like that. Right, and, and maybe a spatial mode. Yeah, that's exactly. That's a spatial mode. Exactly. Yeah. I understand. Thanks. Yes. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much for the talk. I, I completely agree with your conclusions. I don't think that argument works. I'm delighted to hear that. <laughs> but but just a, a point of curiosity. I noticed in your book, for example, you have a chapter on master equations. Um, would it? You also said that. Quantum mechanics, as you're hearing it in the Everett interpretation, is unrecognizable to you. Um, if one were to give an Everettian interpretation of these master equations that was relatively clear, would, would, would that change your mind a little, perhaps, uh, so, as common language? So, so, so Simon, thanks very much. And, and so I guess one of the things that we point out in this paper is that everything uh, from here to here might be thought of as interpretation free. So you can apply your favorite interpretation, and it can be read in many different ways. We go into a little bit here. We try to stay away from this interpretation. I mean, we, we give it. We give a, an advocation of one interpretation to some extent, but it's really kind of a, it's hidden away in the epilogue of the of the paper. And so, certainly, I think you can give um, many world Everettian type accounts of master equations. Right? You can think about, for example, in these so-called quantum trajectories. One way of thinking about it is that every little uh, step of the master equation, you're, you're splitting your universe at every step. So I think you can make kind of a story like that. Um, I don't particularly find it compelling, but, but since you asked the question, I have to say something. And Lev was handing out prizes earlier. I want to hand you out a prize, Simon, uh, my, the Jordan Prize, because I thought your talk, for me anyway, was the one talk of the session that was, I thought, um, faithful to the Everett interpretation but also did something, did something with it, did something interesting. You were counting these branches, you were giving some kind of measure. So, 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 so one of the criticisms I make in my book about interpretations is so often I find them sterile. You come along and you see some phenomena and you come back afterwards and you tell some story. It's just a story. But if it's, if it's a true interpretation, it should lead you deeper into, and reveal something to you. So, I, so your talk I thought was, uh, in my mind, the most um, fruitful of the many worlds uh, approaches, because you were trying to do something, but you're trying to make some kind of quantitative analysis. Um, thank you for, for that. And, and may I just say to everyone that it does seem to me that the Everton interpretation, in order to prove its worth, had, had better be a method for rendering intelligible and perspicuous all aspects of quantum in whatever formalisms. And you'd better be able to figure it out in path integral formalisms and master equations formalisms and so forth. And I do think it, in that sense, it's nowhere near been explored because actually it means the exploration of quantum mechanics. So. Thanks.
Thanks. I was uh, just wondering if it's possible already to say something about the Gerhard uh, Renner argument, about the histories that we heard earlier. That's, so does your account rule that argument as well? Uh, so, so as far as I, I, I was chatting, uh, who, who was I chatting with about, about this? Yes, you, I saw you. You raised your hand. That's right. We had a very nice chat last night while walking through Jaffa. And, uh, and as far as I understand it, the argument is about uh, trying to prove the consistency of the many worlds interpretation. And I understand it's not yet uh, published. And please keep in mind, the reason I'm giving the talk now and not on the second day is because my plane was delayed. And so I didn't actually get to hear the talk. But I would certainly be very interested to talk more about this and try to understand uh, what's going on there. Can you put uh, this left part of this? So maybe the many worlds have some negative in, uh, contribution. Because um, how long does measurement take? OK. Can the measurement be reversed? Definitely. This is positive. Is it possible to track quantum wave function collapse in time? So you don't have to waste time on it. There is no such a thing. Um, Okay, so, so this is where I think the recent findings of physics can really help elucidate. The reason I put this here is because it's been done in the laboratory. We have data on this. We, we can track that wave function collapse in time. I can tell you as a function of time what the quantum state is, and we can verify it using quantum state tomography. So this is some new physics that needs to be taken into account of to have, if we can't get the physics right, we have no hope of getting the metaphysics right. But, no hope, you know, we, <laughs> we spend one week and I hope we'll continue and there is a hope. And uh, I think still, I think, you, you're trying to say that it's in, inconsistent to say that there's no collapse and in your laboratory you have this experience because the many word says so what it's trying to say is that the quantum mechanics is correct. All the calculations which you are do are all nice, all, all correct, and they don't have this, I think, I don't know, what, what do you think? Action at a distance, it's not an ugly property, you don't worry about this? Because it's unavoidable if you do not accept it. Uh, it, it, it Point. By the word it, you mean the Everettian interpretation? Never, I think it's good enough too. Yeah. No, so I reject that. So, so I, I, I could, of course, give my own view, but I think that would take too long and be sort of off the topic of this conference. But, 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 um, but, but I would say uh, it, it's simply an empirical fact that we can now track this wave function collapse and monitor it as it collapses to the eigenstates of the measurement operator. It, it's simply done in the laboratory. We have data, right? Yeah. Is it possible to, tra to, to track how long it takes for the worlds to split? It would be equivalent to what makes But it's an experiment. Yeah, but, but I think for Lev, the world splitting is like that. No. No? no. no. Okay, okay. The world splitting and your measurement of collapse is exactly the same Okay, story. okay, so, so, so that... So, Absolutely right. Okay, so Lev, if I'm a menu order, what you do, you um, the word splitting is kind of effective process for us. Yes, okay, so, so so this is what you observed in laboratory. Although really in nature, the parallel, uh, what's happened, uh, we just split to, an, to another word during. Uh, so 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 so, so Lev, so I can grant that um, you can tell the same story in different words. You can give a different interpretational gloss on it, but the data is the data, right? And unless we understand how to predict that, those results, uh, I think that comes first before we tell stories about it. But again, I can give, I, at least for me, action at a distance is unthinkable. And I think for a long period of time, and many philosophers thought that this is unacceptable. And I can, See, understand all your results and experiment without action at a distance. This is a, essentially 90% of reason, for, at least for me, to believe in many words. And I believe maybe for others, they have some other reason. Yeah. This is the reason why we need many words. To 
understand what's going on without this unthink unthinkable idea that I can do something here and change something there? So that's a great question, and I will freely admit that my book uses a lot of dirty words. It uses the word measurement, it's even in the title, it uses the word apparatus or instrument, and it uses the dirtiest of all the dirty words, collapse. Right? And so uh, how you think about collapse, of course, depends on your interpretation of quantum mechanics. But in terms of the state going to an eigenstate of the measurement operator, that's simply an irrefutable fact of nature. It's in the, in the experiments. You can tell stories about how to describe that. You know, we give an interpretation in terms of uh, the state as a measure of information, but you don't have to do that. You can have other views of it. But unless we get the physics right, again, we have to get the physics right first. It's a state. But it's something that exists in here. So may the chairman go to another question. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. If uh, if the collapse was mentioned and uh, it ta it takes some time, how is this uh, against the manual interpretation and not against the Copenhagen because there there is no specification that the collapse needs to take some time. You just m make the measurement and boom, collapse happens. That's a great question. And one of the things we, we talk about in the book is actually we've learned a lot since 1920 and 1930. We've learned a lot of new things. And so part of understanding, part of the reason I wrote this book is so we can refine our understanding since 1920. So one of the, one of the scare quotes I have in my book is that most physicists' interpretations or understanding of quantum mechanics is stuck somewhere between 1920 and 1980. There's been a lot that's happened since 1980. It's described in our book, so go buy it. Okay, thank you. But still, there are, sorry. <laughs> um, this shows that there is possibly some dynamics that- uh, Yes, exactly. That's what the book is all about, the dynamics of the collapse and how to describe it quantitatively, not just words, equations, predictions, experiments. Great, I read it, thank you. I'm just trying to understand what happens in that, in the, that third line. I mean, my, my first guess is that you have some subsystem that maybe is, was you measured to be in some pure state, and then you couple it to something else, but then you do, you do an ensemble of these things. So, I, so, so for each, each little time after, this is my guess, and you tell me if I'm wrong. Each little time after that, you, you take the ensemble and you measure that density matrix. And then, and then, and then you know, then you do it for a different the ensemble with the same initial conditions, and you wait a little bit longer, and you do it again, and you again. Is it true that that what you're getting is basically the density matrix of the subsystem as it becomes entangled, or do you actually, or do you furthermore, does it actually collapse to a single diagonal element? That's a great question, and the answer is the latter. The answer is it's not a measure of averaging at every time step. It's a measure of doing one, one experiment, getting one data trace as a function of time, and predicting what the state is at every point in time in that data trace, a single trajectory of your experimental is it run. A single trajectory of a pure state or a single trajectory of a density matrix? So we discuss both cases. In the ideal case, if there's no environment, if you have a so-called quantum limited measurement. So one of the questions is, uh, what limits does quantum mechanics put on amplification? How does one build a quantum limited amplifier? If you have a quantum limited amplifier, the state remains pure the entire time. Okay, so uh, do you actually claim that you found a deviation from unitary evolution? Of course. 
every time you make a measurement, you can get deviation from unitary evolution. That in order to describe the dynamics of this jointly, continuously measured quantum system, you have a unitary part and you have a non-unitary part. Is the mechanism that, uh, I mean, is there some new force that you've experienced? The, the measurement process provides the new force. So it's uh, something special inside uh, the measurement apparatus that... That's right. The process of coupling your, your uh, whatever your insula or your meter is to the system. So it, it, we give examples. We give several physical examples. So one example is you imagine trying to measure the position of an electron on a double quantum taut qubit using a conductance measurement as one example. Another example is trying to figure out the state of a superconducting quantum system using microwave frequency measurements. But the claim is uh, once, you're, once you uh, use this kind of system that you can indeed uh, have both the, the, the interaction is between, the, say, the microwave frequency photon and the qubit, and that gives a, effectively a kick or disturbance to the system when you, when you measure the state of the light. So I, I would have thought that the uh, measurement apparatus also follow quantum mechanics. That's right, and, and so you, you... It's unitary evolution. No, because... Uh, all, I mean, so, so you have some point in, in which you say... It depends on your interpretation. So, so in, in, a, in, a, in a Bohr point of view, you would say simply you impose collapse uh, of your meter, right? And so you get a particular result that comes from the amplification process following Bohr. If you're a many worlds there, you can say the universe branches. But in any case... Bohr actually said what you said. Okay, but anyway, uh, the point is, is that we have a definitive measurement outcome. The de measurement outcome is not fuzzy, it's sharp. And once you have that definitive measurement outcome, then you can assign a new state based on the information. And that's what this science is about. Okay. The data you have on your laboratory, that's the information I'm talking about. Um, just another quick question, if I can. Um, you said that the quantum state is bound up with our beliefs or knowledge or something. Is the same true of the density matrix in the master equation? Yes. In my, in my view, yes. Right. OK. So then the backup question is, is anything representational? Is there any notion of representation going on? In That's a great question, too, Simon. So, so we, we, we kind of give some reflection on that. So what are the objective features of the state? You know, so, and indeed, so we say things like um, the spectrum uh, of an observable has, uh, you know, uh, structural elements of the theory. The fact that fermions are anti-symmetric states and bosons are symmetric states. There are some things that you can say about the structure of the theory without uh, having uh, any knowledge of, of what's going on. And, and so, uh, yeah, so, so in our view, it, it's a reflection of our state of knowledge or beliefs, and, and different observers can have different assignments on that state. Right, right. So if I look at a bound state, you know, a reasonably complicated atom, um, we've got visual representations of those which are basically plotting the wave function or the center of mass, or I don't know what. So what about those representational features of molecules? Do molecules have those shapes as thus depicted by bound states? Yes, so, so, so again, it's a good question. And, and so I would say if you have knowledge of the state you're in, then that's the right state to assign. Right? But, but what if you don't know which bound state it's in? It could be a superposition of bound states. And, and then it's reflective of my degree of knowledge about the system. Right, but now I'm getting very philosophical because suppose I have rational reason to believe that the shape of the molecule is such and such. Am I not entitled to say the shape of the molecule is such and such? And is that not using the state in a representational way? C certainly. So you can assign a state. I guess my point of view, we forget quantum mechanics is just a theory. It's our theory as rational agents of the world. We can assign whatever state we want. It may not be a good representation. So someone that can assign it better than me will have better predictive power over that. But I wanted, since you mentioned this word philosophy, someone was giving some kind of nasty comments in the, earlier in the class about physicists. And I, and I just wanted to say, I got into physics because I'm fascinated by philosophy. I, because it's my, my interest in philosophy that drove me to understand the physics better. So I think trying to say physicists are not interested in philosophy, for me anyway, is simply not true. No, I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> I didn't say that. I wasn't, I wasn't accusing you, Simon. <laughs> who is also has a picture in my book.
Thank you so much, Andrew. I love your talk and look forward to reading your book. So I'm thinking about the third question. And since there's many advocates, many worlds here, just be provocative. I want to say the Bowman mechanics can give one answer to the third question, at least quantitatively and qualitatively. If you think about the global state involved unitarily, the subsystem conditional state actually collapses over time, depending on configuration of the environment. So the conditional density measure, conditional wave function of the subsystem, the particle itself, actually go through unitary phases and also non-unitary dynamics. So the non-unitary dynamics we discover in experiment can correspond to the dynamics of the subsystem conditional wave function of the particle. Thanks for the comment. A great question. Um, so this is our own homemade formalism. So, so, so many form people describe continuous quantum measurements in terms of stochastic master equations or stochastic Schrodinger equations. We have our own house formalism called the stochastic path integral. So it's not the Feynman path integral, it's our own invention. And it, it counts for all possible quantum trajectories. It's a path, it's a path in Hilbert space. And what you do is you actually extremize, there's actually a stochastic action you write down, and you extremize the stochastic action, and that tells you what the most likely path a quantum system goes from point A to point B. You can think of it in some sense as a generalization of Yakir's uh, weak value, but to a continuous set of paths, and you can test that in the laboratory. You can see what, what, where these trajectories clump in, in, in space, and then actually measure this path and, and compare it with the theoretical predictions. We should go to the lunch, but I want to ask uh, uh, to answer one question. It looks like you are very, have a very strong position that many words is not appropriate, and BOM, for example, appropriate to what you see in laboratory. You, know, you noticed. Do you consider your experiment as experimental proof that it, uh, which distinguish between many words which have no collapse and let's say BOM, which have effective collapse or any other collapse theory. Lev, you have to tell me which experiment you're referring to. The, the experiment about uh, your, uh, you said that you see in laboratory the quantum, uh, what exactly, how, how uh, you measure. If you measure the time of a collapse, so you see the collapse. And I say you, don't, you, you, don't, you cannot do this because there is no such a thing. The collapse doesn't happen. I, Sandu was trying to say that there's a word splitter, but no, no, you said no. This is a not right way to discuss it. There is a collapse. You strongly believe that many words is not tenable. And boom, was fine because they have effective collapse. And you measured collapse. And many words says, bluntly, there is no such thing as a collapse. So, and you're trying to say, no, this is not acceptable. So, will you consider this experiment of a time of a collapse as a proof that there is a collapse? Uh, so, so, Lev, I have great confidence in the ingenuity and creativity of all these story makers to be able to take any kind of data and push it into any kind of interpretation that, that, that they want. Uh, so so I, I have absolute confidence in your ability to do this. What I'm saying is I just don't think it's the right way to view it. I don't think it's a productive way to view it. I think it doesn't lead to new physics. And, uh, but, but, but does it defend, give definitive proof that no, it's this interpretation and not that interpretation? No, because I don't think you can, as far as I can tell, I don't think you can do that. I think uh, that, that in terms of the quantum theory, these are all meta narratives and the sense that they survive, they survive only in the sense that they can, they can conform to the outcomes of even new quantum predictions they didn't think about. It's just last comment by me, we'll go to lunch. The whole story of many words that we want to say is that uh, that collapse. If we don't, we believe in collapse. We will need to look for new physics, and many words allows to say that the physics we know is perfect, and we don't need uh, to look for something else. Okay, so, so maybe one last thing. One of the things I learned in this conference is that Lev's view of many worlds theory seems to be different than everyone else's. Because I asked you an important question last night, Lev. I said, for you, is the condition for wave function branching the same as what most sort of conventional physicists would say is the condition for measurement? And you said, yes. And I think that answer is probably unsatisfactory to the philosophers of science in this room because it doesn't do the kind of philosophical work they want to accomplish. 
and so uh, I think it, it, it's, it's important to realize that there are different approaches to this branching issue. Okay, I promise, now it's lunch. Okay. <laughs>